I don't think there is a person on the planet right now. I heard one guy, he came out of the bush from hunting and he'd been in the bush for several weeks and he's caught by the police, um, you know, out and about as the police are pulling over people. And I heard some of our, 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 our people, uh, but in any case, no, I won't mention. So, so the thing is, is that Bev shaking your head at me. So um, I got wonderful stories. So enough to say that um, he got pulled over and he didn't know what coronavirus was. He thought it was a new type of beer or something. Uh, and the police believed him and let him go. So enough to say that everybody, I think, now is aware of what's happening right throughout the whole earth. And even in nations, where uh, there is no coronavirus, like Tonga. There is nations, praise God for Tonga, are coronavirus free. Fiji's only got a few, few cases, but you know, everybody's heard about it. And the world, it's true, it's living in a time of a plague, a time of a pandemic. But I believe, listen now, I believe the church is living in a time of promise. The world may be living in a time of plague, but the church is living in a time of promise. You know, we just celebrated Passover. We were all locked up in our homes, just like the night of Passover. I want you to think about this. How significant is that? Around the world, everybody locked up in their homes, partaking of the Passover meal, of, of, of communion, right? But coming up, coming up is Pentecost on Sunday, the 31st of May. Now, friend, listen, we, we need to choose. What are we going to live by? What are we going to live under? Are we going to live under faith or are we going to live under fear? Are we going to live under peace or are we going to live under panic? Are we going to live under sin or are we going to live under salvation? Are we going to live under the plague or are we going to live under the promise? Amen. I want you to read with me Hebrews chapter 11 and beginning in verse 27. And we read the great chapter of, of Hebrews 11, the, the chapter of faith. By faith... Moses, when he came uh, to the years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Think about that, the reproach of Christ. And here's Paul bringing it into the time of Moses. For he had respect unto the recompense of reward by faith. He forsook Egypt, the world, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch him. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to were drowned. Wow, what a great passage of scripture that is. You know, it's been quoted this. Life is short, death is sure, Sin is, sin is the cause, but Christ is the cure. Life is short, death is sure. Sin is the cause, but Christ is the cure. You know, it was only uh, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned about the scripture in Hagar, you know, where God was revealed as a God who sees. And I mentioned that earth had a problem, you know, like Houston, we have a problem. Because by nature, we are all sinners. We're sinners by birth, by choice, and by practice. Amen. And we may, may be rich sinners, we may be poor sinners, we may be educated sinners, we may be ignorant sinners, we may be religious sinners, and we may be irreligious sinners, but we're sinners by nature, by, by birth, by choice, and by practice. And you know, we are sinners and need to be saved, hallelujah, from sin. Because I just want to say that the costliest thing on earth today is not the coronavirus. I know that's costing us plenty. Uh, but the costliest thing on the planet is sin. Sin brings poverty. The ultimate cost, of course, is death. The wages of sin is death. The scriptures talk us that. And so the question is, are we going to live under sin or are we going to live under salvation? Are we going to live under the destruction of life or are we going to live uh, under and by the improvement of life? Uh, in other words, are we going to live under plagues because this is not the first plague and it won't be the last? Or are we going to live under the promises of God? Amen. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, by faith, Moses forsook Egypt. Now, Egypt, as we know, symbolically is a type of the world, a type of sin. And Pharaoh, of course, a type of Satan. And so we see uh, Moses, you know, forsaking the world, forsaking sin. And Egypt, of course, is a bondage, uh, picture of bondage. And Pharaoh, the picture of Satan. You know, we know Pharaoh did not want to let the people of God go. He doesn't give up easily. Satan never gives anybody up or anything without a fight, without a struggle. 
and I remember doing a message and I was reminded about it, about the four compromises. I want you to think about that word, compromises. Compromises is basically a promise with a concession. I think about the political world, a promise made with a concession, right? And of course, the devil compromised. He wanted to compromise with Moses. He, first of all, he said, you need to sacrifice in Egypt. In other words, stay in the world. Then he said, you, don't, you can go, but don't go too far. In other words, don't get too radical. Then he says, you can go, but you're not having the children. You're not having the young people. Man, we need young people. Pastor Marie, great job. Other youth pastors, great job. And then, of course, the last compromise is you, you can go, but you go empty handed. You can't have the cattle. You won't have anything to sacrifice. And so those compromises, compromising the promises of God, but I'm here to tell you, we're not living under the plague. We're not living under compromises. We're living under the promises of God. And so we know the Passover story so well because we only spoke about it at Easter, right? The Passover lamb, the blood of the doorposts and the lintels of the houses. Can you imagine? Imagine with me, please, a little Hebrew boy at the time of Exodus. And, uh, you know, here he is. And he says, Dad, Moses told us to get the lamb. To, to kill the lamb and to put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels. I'm the firstborn of the family. Do you mind if I just go and check that that blood is on the doorposts and the lintels? And he went out and checked it, came back. And, and he says, Dad, did you made sure it was a spotless lamb? I'm the firstborn. Uh, did you make sure it was a spotless lamb without blemish? And Dad said, yes. Dad, did you, did you kill the lamb right? Did we take it on the 10th day and hold it to the 14th? And Dad says, yes, we did everything. Just the way that God, through Moses, commanders, and the little boy says, thank you, Dad, good night. And he goes off to his sleep and sleeps so soundly, trusting the word of the Lord, trusting the promise of God. And you know, there's another little Jewish boy, and he also has a fine dad. And he says, Dad, I'm the firstborn in the household. I, can I just go and check the bloods on the doorposts and on the lintels, that blood? And he goes and checks and the blood's in. He said, Dad, are you sure it was a spotless lamb? And Dad says, yes. And did, did we kill it right? Did we take it on the tent day and hold it? And Dad says, yes, we did everything right. He said, Dad, I know this all sounds good, but if you don't mind, I'm going to sit up all night and pray tonight because I'm not going to be able to sleep a wink, you know? Well, of course, uh, the, the death angel came through in the night and he passes by the first house and passes over that. And the plague did not enter. And he comes to the second house and he passes over that too. That poor little boy stayed up and worried all night for nothing. You know, when you take the word of God, the promises of God, you can rest in the Lord because God cannot lie. You don't have to worry, my friend. You don't have to be anxious. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. And so we are, are we in faith or are we in fear? Are we in peace or are we in panic? Are we living under the plagues or living under the promises? How are we going to live? George Muller, who we quoted before around the offering, said this, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. Wow. Church, we need to rest in the promised and the finished work of the Passover lamb. For he truly is without blemish and he is truly faultless. Even his enemies could not find fault with him. Pilate couldn't find fault with him. But can we just imagine for a moment the third little boy. This boy was Pharaoh's son. He was an Egyptian boy. And he said to his dad, he said to Pharaoh, he said, Dad, you know this Moses guy, this Hebrew guy, you know, he's been troubling our land. He's brought these plagues and he's made all these predictions. And he's just said that uh, there's going to be the plague of plagues, that the firstborn are going to die. That we need to put the blood outside. Dad, what do you think about this? You know, should we get a lamb and put the blood outside? I'm the firstborn. And Pharaoh says to him, son, you don't have to worry, son. He said, I know we've got many religions here in Egypt and they're all good. All roads lead to Rome, as it were. I know he wouldn't have said that. But in any case, take a look around you, son. He said, you live in a palace. You know, we've got prestige. We've got respect. We've got power. You go to sleep, son. Dad loves you. I won't let anything bad happen to you. Moses is just one of those religious fanatics. He's one of those Bible-believing people. You'll be okay. Don't give the lamb idea a second thought. But you know the, the story, my friend. You've read the book. And you know, at midnight, there's a great scream throughout the land. And all the firstborn, even the one in Pharaoh's household, was struck with that plague. You know, as I mentioned before, as the world has seen, the, this plague, coronavirus, has got no favorites, whether they're rich or they're poor. 
whether black or whether white, whether royalty or commoner, whether politician or whether public. See, the truth is, my friend, many live in Pharaoh's house and they're living not under the promises of God, but many are in the shadow of the plague. You know, even if Pharaoh had taken the gold or the rubies or the diamonds and adorned the doorposts of his house with the treasures of the world, it would have been no good because God said, when I see the blood, the blood of the Passover lamb, I will pass over you. You know, the good book says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. See, life is in the blood. It's not in silver and gold. We haven't been redeemed with silver and gold, but redeemed with the precious blood of the lamb. You know, I often say God is a God of progression from glory to glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. From strength to strength, line upon line, precept upon precept. And you think, you know, God started with an altar and he went to a tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moses, and then to a temple, the temple of Solomon. Then Jesus comes along and says something greater than the temple is here. And then he said to the church, you will go and do greater things. Amen. You know, he started with a man. He started with Abraham. He went to a family, Jacob and his 12 sons. Then he went to the nation, the nation of Israel. And of course, today with the world, with whosoever. But I want you to think about this. This is a new thought. And when a person sinned in Genesis, it was one lamb per person. In Exodus, we read it as one lamb per family. In the promised land, it was one lamb per the nation. You know, the high priest would sacrifice the lamb on the day, as you know. When John the Baptist came preaching, he said, Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One lamb per person, one lamb per family, one lamb per the nation, and now one lamb for the sin of the world. Wow. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We're living in the days of a modern plague. Obviously, there's sickness and obviously there's death. And it's sad when anybody dies. But you know, lots of people are dying of all kinds of sicknesses, be it cancer, heart, all kinds, just, you know. And so people are dying and all, and all that's sad. But the plague, you know, Pharaoh brings more than just sickness and death. When you think about it, job losses. I've talked with the business people. Lives have been turned upside down. Businesses uh, are in a shambles. Economic ruin. So, you know, this plague, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, listen now. You know, because the enemy comes to rob, kill, and destroy, it doesn't bring only sickness and doesn't bring only death, but it brings financial ruin. It brings stress. It brings depression. It can bring anxiety. It can bring other health issues, mental health issues. And so I don't want to live under that plague. I don't want to live under Pharaoh's regime. Amen. I want to live under the blood of the Passover lamb. I want to live under the promises of God of divine deliverance. You know, when all this started, churches around the world were reading Psalm 91. We read Psalm 91 as well when I talked about shake, not being shaken and so forth. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses to get to where I want to go today. But in Psalm 91, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know, George Muller, that man, that, that wonderful saint, there's so many like it. Bev, Bev just been reading about Charles Spurgeon. These men spent so much time with the Lord. And, and uh, you know, in fact, George Muller says, I do not leave the presence of God until I have my answer. I mean, these were incredible guys. I was praying this morning and I, you know, I feel, you know, kind of like backslidden in their sight. But, you know, it's not good to compare. But they just had something. No two ways about that. They didn't have the internet, we know, but they had something. Hallelujah. And I'm going to talk about that. And so it says in verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. It says his, in, in verse 4, his truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction. Let me just flick over, if I can, to verse 10. No evil shall befall you, nor any plague come near.
your dwelling. Amen. And verse 14, I love it. It says, because you have known my name. Oh, we've been talking about the name of the Lord on our legacy project. I did 22 names of God. But, you, you know, I encourage you to look at the legacy project. And, and I've just done some more filming this week in relation to uh, grace and works. I, I've just done the offerings. I've done uh, the feasts and so forth and five offerings in, in Leviticus also. And so they're going to be up on the platform soon. And, and uh, there's so much material there that you can uh, study and look into it. But because you've known my name, hallelujah, um, I will deliver him, it says. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be, it says in verse 15, I will be with him in trouble. Okay, let me get to where I'm going this morning with, with all of this, right? I know, you know, we're talking about living under a plague or living under a promise. Now, think about this. Please, please, please hear me. Passover to Pentecost. Passover and Pentecost. 50 days between Passover and Pentecost. 40 days of that, Jesus was appearing to his disciples, talking to them about the kingdom of God. They were then 10 days in the upper room, in the upper room, locked in, in the upper room. Fear of being persecuted, being dobbed in, as it were. Hello, lots of dobbing in going on right now. Jesus talked about it in the Bible that brother would even turn on brother and mother and, and, and father, and, you know, whatever. So, so in any case, the thing is, is that people are getting dobbed in today for other reasons. But here they were 10 days in the upper room. Now 10 is the number of testing. They were waiting upon the Lord to receive the promise of power from above. I wonder, church, whether you join me in some fasting during that 10-day period. I know it's not going to be within one of our three-day fasts, but I'm just sensing that we need to fast coming up to this Pentecost. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Let me read it. The former account I made, O Thephilus, uh, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he... You notice how many he's are in this when, when I talk about it, because we're talking about Jesus, right? He was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, was given commandments to the apostles, which he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive with his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking to of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. So when they were assembled together, it was, you know, just a, a handful. I can't say 10. There was 12 disciples. Well, in fact, only 11 at this particular time. Judas had betrayed Jesus and they hadn't drawn lots for the next disciple. And so there's 11. It's nearly, you know, what we're allowed today on level three, right? And, um, and they had one extra one. But in any case, he, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. Everybody say the promise, the promise, but to wait for the promise, to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Wow. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? You know, a lot of people are asking, Right now, is this the last days? Is this, is this the midnight hour? Is Je when's Jesus coming back? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times of the season which the Father has put into his own authority, but you receive power. You know, I want to tell you, be ready to be prepared. We're, we're living in two, two, no two ways about in perilous days. I was reading, as I mentioned, George Muller. And George Muller said, you know, and listen, this is in the 18th century. He said, we are in the evil last days. Every generation thinks they're in the last days, but we're seeing things today that they didn't see. No two ways about it. And, uh, you know, we need to be aware of that. But you shall receive power, verse 8. You will receive power. You will receive power. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. We need the anointing of God to break the yoke, to bring healing and deliverance to people. You know, I was talking with the mayor and other senior leaders in Auckland just on online this week, and he was talking about the 20 or 30 uh, still living on the streets that won't come off the streets. But he's saying because of the mental health issues and drugs and so forth that, that they, they don't want to. The only thing that's going to help those people, the food parcels, okay, you can keep them maybe alive and food, but the only thing that's going to help them is the power of God to deliver them and to set them free from the snare of the fowler, from the bondage of Egypt, like that man in the tombs that Jesus said about. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, New Zealand. Hallelujah. And when he had spoken these things, they watched 
while he was taken up out of sight, a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, saying, who also said, men of Galilee, why are you standing, staring, gazing to heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come, so come in the like manner. Hallelujah. He is coming again as you saw him go into heaven. And so, yes, this morning, I'm not necessarily talking about the second coming of Christ. It's going to happen. We need to be ready always. We need to live our lives ready. George Muller lived his life ready. He never saw it. Uh, Reinhard Bonnke never saw it. He believed in it. He never saw it. But the thing is, is that there is a great cloud of witnesses and we need to be ready for whenever that happens. We don't know the hour of the day, but we know some signs and some seasons. And Jesus said back in the Gospels that we would understand those signs and seasons because he talked about those as well. But you know, the thing is, is that plagues or promises, this is what we do know, friend. I've mentioned what the plague brought. I mentioned what the plague brought. It brings sin. It brings destruction. It brings misery. It brings poverty. But what I really want to focus on today is what the promise brings, what the promise brings. George Muller said this, my eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. I'd love to talk to you about the story that was given uh, in uh, that quote, but I can't. I don't have time. You can Google George Muller and read that story when he is on a ship in the fog there. And he prayed a simple prayer and the fog disappeared. My eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. So can I conclude by talking for a moment on the promises of God? Number one, the promise of power. Are you ready? And do you believe for the promise of power? Acts 1.8 but you shall receive power. Acts 2.39, this is for you, for your children, and to all her far off, as many as the Lord would call to himself. The promise of power. The promise of his presence. Hebrews 13.5, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Hey, just those two promises alone, hallelujah, will do you good today. I'm preaching myself happy right now. i got to continue. The promise of peace. John 14.27, my peace I give unto you. 2 Timothy one, uh, verse set, 1 verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, peace, and a sound mind. The promise of power, the promise of presence, the promise of peace, the promise of provision, Jehovah Jireh, Luke 12, 31, and all these things will be added unto you. When he's talking about not worrying about food and clothing and so forth. In fact, New Living Translation says, and he will give you everything you need. Ha ha, ha ha, promise of provision, promises of provision. Plenty. John 10 verse 10. I've come to bring you life and life more abundantly. Promises of his protection. We read it in Psalm 91. Promise of power, promise of presence, promise of peace, promise of provision, promise of plenty, promise of protection. Promises of prosperity. 3 John 1 2. Beloved, I pray above all else that you may prosper and be in good health. Promise of his partnership. John 17 that they may be one. Sorry, that we may be one. Promise of partnership with him. Promise of prayer. Promise of prayer. Romans 8.35 and Hebrews 7.25. He lives forever to make intercession for you. He's praying for you. The promise of his prayer. Hallelujah. The promise of his position. He, Ephesians 2.6, seated us with him in heavenly places far above. Hallelujah. Promise of his place. John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Promise of his pastoral ship. What am I talking about? John 10, he said, I am the good shepherd, shepherd and pastor. Hallelujah. Promise of his perfection. First John 3, 2, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be like him. Promise of his purpose. Ephesians 3.10, that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. And Matthew 28, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The purpose of God, the promise of that, the promise of his potential. John 14.12, are you with me? Uh, greater things will you do because I go to my Father who is in heaven. Promise of his purity. Revelation 3, God gives us a white garment. Can I just run through those very quickly? A promise of his power, of his presence, of his peace, of his provision, of his plenty, of his protection, of his prosperity, of his partnership, of his prayer, 
of his position, of his place, of his pastoralship, of his perfection, of his purpose, of his potential, of his purity. There's something about that letter. And of his pardon. The last one. The promise of his pardon. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to close by reading Romans 10 verse 9. But what are we living under, church? Are we living under the plague and what that brings? Sure, sickness and death, we know. But it also brings worry, anxiety, stress, poverty. Or are we going to live under the promises of God? The promises, I believe, far outweigh the plague. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Romans 10 verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, no distinction. Remember what I said about sinners, you know, rich and poor, black and white and all that. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. So the plague has no distinction. But I'm here to tell you right now, the blood of Jesus has no distinction either. Oh, praise God. You know, Jew or Greek for the same Lord overall is rich to all, all who call upon him. My friend, no matter who you are, no matter whether you're the most rotten sinner or whether you think you're a saint, I want to tell you right now, the blood of Jesus is fit for you. To all who call upon him, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. So just like, as I said, the plague's got no distinction, but the love and the grace and the mercy of God has no distinction either. For whoever believes on him shall be saved. And so choose this day, my friend, the plague or the promise. I know I'm talking to the converted. I know most of you say, I want the promise, obviously. But are we going to speak, uh, speak the promise? Are we going to believe the promise? Are we going to walk in the promise? Don't let the doubts, don't let the fear, don't let the, the anxiety come near your household. Amen. Keep the blood of Jesus. Put on the worship songs that we've been playing. You know, speak in tongues, worship the Lord, give him glory, pick up your word and read it day by day. Instead of, you know, reading all the other stuff, read the word of God. So many people spend time, so much time on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, they tell me now. I'm not under Joe Smith, but under Peter Mortlock. And I got people wanting to befriend me, but I'm not befriending anybody. I'm just there. It's just a platform for me because I, I don't have time to read about other people. I, 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 I want to talk to other people. I want to communicate with other people. I'm interested in what's happening in your life. But I, I, I spend time in this word. This is a book for me. Hallelujah. I hide this in my heart. And so I hope and pray today, friend, that you would live under the promises of God and not the plague that's around the world right now. Let me pray for you today and let me close. Hallelujah.